Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome everyone into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running Nash syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology term podcast. Everyone, welcome into the program. I hope that you're doing well and you are ready for today's program because today we have the one, the only Mr. Ralph Bond. He is our science and technology trends correspondent and if you are at all confused at what that entails, don't worry. It's going to be a fun show and we're going to get into exactly what that is but Let's just say it's going to be nice technology stories that are, you know, uh, flying a little under the radar. But at the same time, you know, we have a story coming up about the solar sail. And if you haven't been keeping up to date on that, uh, that NASA launched earlier this year, uh, hey, we have official images from it. It's uh, it's going to be very cool. Uh, and that's where ComputerAmerica.com comes in. That's where the show notes come in. And that's where anything that we talk about here on the program with Ralph. Uh, and as always, we'll be up on our site, and you can find past shows, future shows, show notes, articles, uh, podcast links, anything and everything right there on our site. And uh, sorry to kind of meander about this, but yeah, the show notes will have links. Ralph does a great job compiling it all together, and you know he's uh, very good at kind of highlighting exactly what we talk about and putting it into the show notes. So if you want to catch more, uh, by the time that you hear this, they will be up and you can, of course, either follow along or catch them after the fact. So with that being said, uh, welcome into the program. And everyone, again, I hope that you're having a wonderful week. I know some uh, some big bad things have happened this week, but that is not the place for it uh, today. Today with Ralph, we're going to have a nice, calming, relaxing uh, segment that involves really in a lot of ways high technology things that are going to uh, you know hopefully solve a lot of issues uh, maybe not today maybe not tomorrow but hey in the future it all matters so with that being said let's go ahead and bring ralph on ralph welcome back on to computer america how you been back ben and you couldn't have said it better this is a world of darkness and horrible things going on this is an oasis today of high tech stories that'll leave you uplifted and hopeful about the future of our planet and our people and everything else on it. <laughs> so what Ben and I do each Friday, if you're new to the show, is we highlight four recent articles that show us key trends and developments in all kinds of stuff, artificial intelligence, robotics, medical technology, sustainable energy technology, transportation advances, agricultural tech, space research, physics, you name it across the board. And again, the most important thing of all, we're going to give you an oasis of positive news thanks to the world of science and technology. All right. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think we'll go ahead. Uh, for those out there who are watching the video portion, we appreciate that. And you can see that our first story is uh, going to be, uh, you know, as we were kind of talking about before the show, reminiscent of another story, which uh, kind of taps into the trends part of your title. Uh, right. Which I'm glad to see that, you know, this is not just something that's, you know, a kooky idea that, you know, may have some application. <laughs> but uh, this one is maybe potentially instead of an abandoned uh, lithium mine or coal mine, whatever it was that they had mined out and turned into a battery. Um, this hits a little bit closer to home. So story number one. Yes. Yeah, story number one comes from CNN headline. The next world's tallest building could be a 3,000 feet high battery. And you might be going, whoa, what? You need, first and foremost, we're going to be talking about something called gravity batteries. And we'll get into that in just a moment. You have to sort of expand your mind about what you think of as a battery. Most of us think of a battery, a battery in our car, little batteries we put in our remote controls, uh, big batteries that are on the wall in your house or in, in industrial situations that mm -hmm. are storing up excess energy. Th those are all batteries, of course, but we're going to talk about something called a gravity battery, which is a really remarkably simple but powerful idea. So with that said, let's get into the story. This is... It, uh, 
a few months ago, as Ben and I were talking before we went on air here, a few months ago, we uh, talked about the use of gravity batteries in an abandoned mine. Now, this first story is a few months old, but I just thought it was so interesting and a, another example of a growing interest in gravity batteries. But first, let's set the stage with a tutorial reminder about gravity batteries. Gravity batteries are an innovative type of energy storage device that harnesses gravitational potential energy. That'll be made clear in just a second. Here's a simple breakdown of how they work. When there's excess energy from in renewable sources like solar or wind, it's used to lift heavy mass, such as a water or solid weights to a higher elevation. When energy is needed, that mass is allowed to drop or fall converting potential energy back into electrical energy through generators. So picture in your mind a, a mine shaft, or in this case, a very tall building that has a cavity with a large heavy weight going all the way up to the top. And then when it's time to generate energy, they start letting it drop, fall. And as it falls, it's engaging generators that are spinning and creating the electricity. So that's the simplicity of a gravity battery in the show notes. I add to these articles a lot of this extra tutorial information and links. There's a whole set of links here about what gravity batteries are all about. You can go and check that out if you want to learn more. But with all of that set up said, mm -hmm. here's the news. At the end of May, Skidmore, Owens & Merrill, famous, famous architectural firm, the architecture and engineering firm behind some of the world's tallest buildings, announced a partnership with the energy storage company called Energy Vault to develop new gravity energy storage solutions for buildings, not for abandoned mines, but for buildings. That includes a design, a proposed design for a skyscraper that would use a motor powered by excess electricity from the grid to elevate giant blocks when energy demand is low. And these blocks would store the electricity as potential energy when there's a demand for that uh, electricity, the blocks would be lowered, releasing the energy to drive generators, as we said a few moments ago, which would then be converted into electricity. It, it's such a, Ben, it's such a simple idea, but so potentially great if we're going to be building more of these high structures. And you could even build a structure that does nothing but be a gravity battery if you wanted it, to, right? It's a very, and, and you know, uh, earlier when we did the story about the mine shaft, it was like, oh, you got this big right. hole in the ground. Um, right. You know, what do you do with it? And by the <laughs> same token, like, yeah, that's a, you know, a couple thousand feet down, but then you think about skyscrapers and you're like, that's a yeah. couple thousand feet up. Like, it, yep. it, it's almost a great kind of one to one that they've uh, kind of hit on here. Yeah, I agree completely. And going on with the story, Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill and Energy Vault's proposed superstructure tower, which could range anywhere from as little as 300 feet or 1,000 meters to 950, or pardon me, 985 to 3,300 feet in height. And I bought, I butchered that. Let me do that again. <laughs> so the the so the proposed superstructure tower they're talking about, which could range range, pardon me, from 300 to 1,000 meters, convert that 985 feet to 3,300 feet in height mm. would have hollowed out structures resembling elevator shafts for moving the blocks, leaving room for residential and commercial tenants. And again, if you're listening to us as a podcast only, I couldn't encourage you more to come out to computeramerica.com, get the link to the video so you can see what we're talking about. And of course, get the show notes and use all the links to see things further as well. And the firms are also looking at integrating, integrating pumped storage hydropower into skyscrapers using water instead of blocks. So they're looking at both the solid weight as, as well as water as the force that would drop and generate the electricity. Now, hey. ultimately, yeah, go ahead, Ben. Yeah, no, uh, and, and uh, their website actually has some great videos that are a bit longer yeah. than the one included in the article. Um, and, and you can tell this is done by a very nice uh, design firm because like the, yes. the, the, the mock-ups are just stunning. Of course, they kind of yes. go like, Especially like this, uh, this EVC, like they're talking about the EVU, this is the EVC, where it's this just big cylindrical thing that, you know, mm -hmm. kind of takes it to the nth degree, uh, covered in solar panels, and it yeah. has like all the different green technology. It's a, it's a radical idea, but it's so cool to see. I know, isn't that neat? And yeah, that goes to the point about maybe having a structure, a tower, if you will, that is dedicated just to this energy generation, mm -hmm. generation 
uh, mission. So that's kind of cool. So ultimately, as the article goes on to say, multi gigawatts hours of potential energy could be stored, which is enough to power several buildings. So not only their vision is not only to be able to power the building itself that they're proposing, but it could generate so much energy, it could be sent off to help other buildings in the surrounding area. That's kind of cool. And according to the design team, when it comes to gravity energy storage structures, the taller, the better, of course. A very tall gravity energy storage structure could offset its embodied carbon from construction and materials within two to four years. So all the carbon emission badness, if you will, of a building could be offset by having one of these gravity batteries incorporated. So that's kind of cool. And to wrap things up here, Skidmore, Owens and & Merrill and Energy Vault are now looking for development partners to turn their designs into reality. So this is a stay tuned. Let's see where we go over the next year or so. For sure. And, and uh, you know, again, just kind of poking around their site, like they, yeah. they make some good arguments and like, the first one was like, you know, uh, way at the beginning of the article you mentioned to expand what you thought of as a battery. Uh, yes. They keep re referring to this as an energy vault, as in, you know, simply you just put energy in and you can access it whenever. I like uh, that. Yeah. But it, it's it's this idea that, you know, there's no electrochemical reactions. You know, there there's not like mm -hmm. big liquid batteries underneath like hospitals mm -mm. and stuff like that. Like it's just... It's just giant weights that, you know, worst case scenario, they fall to the ground. You know, like that's 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 not ideal, but you know, that's kind of the worst case scenario. <laughs> um, you know, there's no let there's no chemical waste, there's no chemical spillage. Right. You can have this right in the middle of uh, a city. Like Ralph, you couldn't put like a nuclear reactor right in the middle of New York, but you could have one of yes. these towers, you know, right in the middle yes. of New York and it wouldn't look out of place. Um, That's right. And Ben, ben uh, another obvious statement on my part would be no lithium, no precious metals, mm -hmm. no uh, worry about recycling uh, a traditional battery of sorts, right? This is so, uh, what I love about gravity batteries, and I'm so excited to see the momentum picking up for their implementation and creation, is how unbelievably eco-friendly they are that's the thing that i think is just fantastic absolutely and, and and they even have another set of of um uh, of ideas that are pretty cool on the site you should go check those out yourselves and you yes. know kind of showing you a little bit of the video but they're essentially taking the same idea ralph except they're taking like you know just an average hillside that you see you know you all, go. all over this yes. country and yes. having multiple rails and essentially the same idea except instead yep. of a giant skyscraper you kind of take up the whole hillside put up like a I think like gondolas and the gondolas that are like a dozen of them would be your energy battery so you don't there have to be go. as tall you don't have to be as intricate as a building you could just use the hillside as a natural battery to store and release yeah. energy so yeah. I love it. I just there, love there, it. <laughs> there's a lot of very cool ideas. And, and and it goes to what I usually say is like, there's much smarter people than myself working <laughs> on these problems of ours that we have. And we're going to get our arms around it. We, we really yes. will. So Yes, we will. Very, very, very hopeful <laughs> there. So story number one, very, very cool. And again, follow <laughs> through the links and check out the site. Story number two. Mm -hmm. uh, the Japanese are known for uh, a number of things. Uh, and I think, you know, one of them has been for a long time, their maglev uh, trains. They're, mm -hmm. you know, they, they go very, very fast. Um, their train system is the envy of the world. No one can doubt that the Japanese know how to, like, run on time. Ralph, I think there was, like, one instance <laughs> in the past, like, 20, 30 years <laughs> where a train has come in late um, by, like, two minutes and <laughs> the director resigned in disgrace. Uh, because the train was two minutes late. Like they have efficiency down to a science. Um, yes. So, you know, it makes sense that they would take the technology that's working and try to miniaturize it, extend it, go on and, um, you know, and, and really proliferate it. Uh, is this the answer to everything? Probably not. Is it a really cool, fun <laughs> idea? Absolutely. So story number two. Yes. Story number two comes from an outfit called electrictechnology.org. Great website, by the way, and one I recently kind of got onto. Headline here, Japan introduces magnetic levitation car technology. And I'm going to put out a little kind of qualifier, reality check right up front. Great idea, 
Very interesting. I have some thoughts about how this could be truly implemented in the real world, but there would be a huge infrastructure challenge to implement this uh, in a large scale. But mm -hmm. we'll get into that. Bunch of links in the show notes here to augment this. But this is a really fun story, and the graphics that they've cre created for this uh, are very, very attractive, stunning. Hey, but Ralph, let's get into the, this. The, yeah. and, and I just have to say, like, real quick from the outset, yeah, this is like a good use of AI. Um, you know, yes. instead of having like an artist and, and, you know, I'm not saying that an artist can't do this or shouldn't do this, but right. I'm saying that for the purposes of the article, they can take things that are described in text, yeah. give it to the AI model. And, yes. uh, the images that you included in, in the article are very clearly AI, but it's like, right. you, you get to visualize very simply what it is they're talking about instead of just having to read the text. So great use yeah. of AI. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and again, come out and get the show notes so you can see what we're talking about and see and get the link to the video so you can see the video portion of our show and, and see all the wonderful stuff Ben is showing you right now. But to get into the story here, it says Japan has introduced a groundbreaking innovation in the automotive industry, magnetic levitation car technology. And this new technology developed by the Quantum Machines Unit at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology could potentially eliminate the need for total, or pardon me, eliminate the need for traditional engines and batteries in vehicles. Now, this is a big picture, very early, early twinkle in the right. eye vision of where things might go. So let's keep that in mind as well. A little reality check here. Now, magnetic levitation often referred to with the shorthand maglev, is a technology that allows an object to float above a surface without any physical contact using magnetic fields to counteract gravitational forces. So that's maglev, if you're familiar, as Ben certainly is. With maglev trains, that's the same principle. Now, the vision here that they've come up with is that this technology would allow cars to hover a few centimeters above specially designed tracks ding 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 that's the reality part of this we'll get into that some more by eliminating friction maglev cars can achieve much higher energy efficiency compared to conventional vehicles the team's research has focused on utilizing diamagnetic materials and powerful magnets to create a stable levitation effect similar to that used in maglev trains, but with significantly reduced energy consumption. Now, in the show notes, if you want to dive into di diamag pardon me, di diamagnetic materials, I have a little more education on that if you wish. But unlike traditional maglev systems, which require continuous power input, the new technology developed by the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology team only needs energy during the initial startup phase to generate the magnetic field. Once levitation is achieved, the cars can move with minimal energy input, making the system highly efficient. Now, you would need to dive into their research materials and other things like this to fully understand what they're talking about here. But what they're saying is maglev, magnetic levitation trains are great, but you've got to have a lot of power all the time in the mm -hmm. tracks to generate the magnetic field and so on and so forth. They're saying they've come up with a scheme where you have an initial burst of energy to get things going and a very much reduced amount of energy to keep the car going. So how they do this, you need to dig deeper into the resources to fig, you know, learn about that couple of comments about key benefits of this technology, sort of self-evident. Elimination of engines and batteries. I have more details in the show notes if you want to dig into this deeper. Increased energy efficiency, stability, and environmental impact. But reality check. Here we go. This is where I was going ding, ding, ding earlier. <laughs> Despite its promise, the technology is not without challenges, as the article points out. Researchers are currently working on minimizing kinetic energy losses at the surface level and improving vortex damping to ensure stable and smooth operation. Additionally, the infrastructure required for maglev cars, such as specially designed tracks, will require, gee, no duh, significant investment and development. And and, uh, and and honestly, the word significant yeah. is uh, probably under, underselling it yeah. a little bit yeah. even. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you would, in theory, Ben, as you obviously realized, 
if you were to dr- truly convert all automobiles in the world to this technology, we'd have to have all of our roadways have these tracks to generate the magnetic fields, right? So, I mean, that's just a huge limitation. By the way, there's a reference to vortex damping. Mm-hmm. And I said, what the heck is that? In the show notes, I provide some optional additional information. You can learn all about vortex damping. It's kind of interesting. It's talking about uh, vibrations and, and wobbly, as, as it were, in magnetic uh, levitation fields. But that's, you know, on a geek out, you can go there. But again, reality check. But it's a great idea. So, Ben, you often what we, you and I do is we look at a story like this and we say, well, okay, let's get real. Converting all of our freeways, everything with these tracks, probably not going to happen. But... Where could it happen? And I immediately thought about an airport situation. What am I talking about right now? There are trains that go sometimes in between terminals at an airport. That's mm-hmm. great. But what about those outlining parking lots where you get on a big bus and you're, all your luggage and, uh, and you're and, and going the shuttles, out to yeah. the shuttles? What if you just had a constant moving array of little cars on these magnetic love tracks that come around and they are all automated and stop and you get your stuff on you you tell the you tell the little car where i where my car is it's in parking lot a uh, stall b or whatever and it just takes you right up to the closest drop-off point and just keeps going around in a circuit over and over again hundreds of these little cars can you imagine that that's where i think this technology could be realistically applied among many other possibilities as well they're they're like Honestly, we built our highway system, you know, uh, in the in the nineteenth or nineteenth or twentieth in the twentieth century, um, and <laughs> yeah. like Ralph, let's be honest, in the future, the highway system that we have today, with everyone owning their little cars and you know, kind of using it, hopping on and off and exit ramps, that is like the ideal use case for something like this technology that they're talking about for maglev yeah. for anything like obviously it would require much more investment much more technology than i think we're even possible <laughs> that than even yeah. is possible right now but right. that's like this is like the next iteration like this would be even more revolutionary than you know the the interstate highway system that uh, that we have going on so yeah. uh, we can dare yeah. to dream we can dare to dream ralph like this story honestly does remind me of the hyperloop uh, the Hyperloop was uh, yes. uh, over 10 years sure. now, if, if you didn't know, when it was first released as a white paper. Right. Um, and I, and <laughs> I believe the Hyperloop as well was also a maglev system. Uh, the only difference is, was that they proposed to put it into a vacuum tube so that there was no air right. resistance and you could get up right. to a much higher speed. Uh, right. This paper doesn't propose, or at least this research doesn't propose that you build, you know, a vacuum tight loop uh, that you have to kind of invest in. But the, but again, the trend has been there before. Uh, they're yeah. pulling from technology from the eighties and nineties with the trains and also the hyperloop. Um, I look forward to seeing where they go with it, but this is very clearly like step one of a thousand. Uh, yeah. But hey, you know, someone has to take that first step. So good <laughs> on them for doing that. And, yes. Um, very, very cool. So there you go. There's story number two. Uh, speaking of a thousand steps, uh, story number three. This one is uh, this one is like a project. Like think of like uh, a science project that had a thousand steps. <laughs> Uh, except they're all automated and you have no control over it. And if any of them break, then uh, boy, oh, howdy, yeah. did everyone just waste a lot of time and money. <laughs> um, story number three, this is like a success story for us because it's something that we've talked about before, but now we get to actually see it in action. And this is very cool. So yeah, uh, yeah. story number three is more of an update. Yes, it is. This comes from space.com, a wonderful outlet. Headline, NASA's solar sail successfully spreads its wings in space. Now, there's been some very, very recent developments, even as of the 4th of of this month, just, what, two days ago, uh, that kind of dampened the uh, positivity of this story. But regardless, regardless, the idea of a solar sail is so interesting, no matter what happens to this thing in space, and you'll get where I'm going with this in a couple of minutes, uh, it's still just such a great technology and a great idea. But let's get into this. And also the bit about um, real images from space of the of the sail. Maybe you can do a quick check, Ben. I yeah, didn't get a chance uh, this, this morning is, to check to see. Yeah, this they, is the oh, image they actually uh, have for, it now. for those who are oh, great, looking at it. Um, great. For those who can't see it, don't worry, you're not really yeah. missing much. It's uh, it's like a foil magnetic, or I'm sorry, yeah. a foil reflective surface uh, next to a solar panel Um it's very kind of point of view, very fisheye, very hard to kind right. of 
you know, discern what it is exactly that they're making out. But oh, thanks. Very clearly, you can see it's something, and that something is a deployed solar sail. So yeah. there's the image. And Ben, if you do me a favor and embed that into the show notes sure. when we Absolutely. go to post it, uh, that would be great. Because I was waiting for those images all day. On uh, They said it was going to come out on the 4th and all day throughout the day. And on the 5th, yesterday, I was going, are they there then? Are they? And you've got it. So that's great. <laughs> I can do that. So, here we go. Let's go into the story, though. More than four months after launching into space earlier this year, a solar sailing spacecraft has successfully spread its wings above our planet. NASA's Advanced Composite Solar Sail System caught a ride to space on April the 24th on Rocket Lab's Electron Vehicle and on August 29, very recently, NASA shared in a news release that its mission operators verified the technology reached full deployment in space. So you have to, the way to picture this thing is like this big kind of square, kind of looks like an umbrella with spines, like an umbrella, and the the an umbrella the is a good way to describe deployed. it. Yeah, yeah, kind of, sort of, but you know, it's just a rectangular uh, deal. Anyway, so the location of the spacecraft, <laughs> excuse me. The location of the spacecraft in its orbit is roughly two times the altitude of the International Space Station. If you were looking at the sail from above, it would look like a square that measures nearly half the size of a tennis court. That's a great analogy. You can really get your picture in your mind of the size of this thing. And it's an approximately 860 square feet or 80 square meters. That's big. And then what's really fun in the article, they talk about, well, how does this work? Solar sails use the pressure of sunlight for propulsion angling toward or away from the sun so that photons bounce off the reflective sail to push a spacecraft. It's, it's so weird to think that sunlight can be pressure. I only think of sunlight as something that's burning my skin and causing me to get <laughs> basal cell carcinoma, but, but, but sunlight can be Propulsion, uh, propulsion, which I just all, think is all really those all those little particles bouncing off your skin. That's yeah, what's bouncing off yeah. the sail. So, yes. and this this principle, this fact, eliminates heavy propulsion systems that could enable longer duration and lower cost missions. That's why NASA is interested in solar propulsion. And the solar sails mission, well, because sails use the power of the sun, they can provide constant thrust to support missions that require unique vantage points, such as those that seek to understand our sun and its impact on Earth. And solar sails have long been a desired capability for missions that could carry early warning systems for monitoring solar weather. And as we may all know, solar storms and coronal mass uh, ejections can cause considerable damage on Earth, overloading power grids, disrupting, disrupting radio communication, and, and affecting aircraft and spacecraft. Now, we just talked a few minutes ago about how I was searching for the images. Thank you, Ben. Mm -hmm. You found them. You're going to put them in the show notes. They are now out there, which is good. But there's sort of a sad update here on the 4th of September. All of a sudden, they reported, however, subsequent observations of the spacecraft show it's tumbling or wobbling through space, which may have also impacted its trajectory around our planet. So this little experiment, we'll see what happens. I don't know if they can correct this thing. I don't think they can, but <laughs> yeah. even if it fails, it's still a step forward in the idea of solar propulsion, which I just think in itself is a fascinating thing to watch. Yeah, it's it's. I guess that wobble, like it doesn't take much wobble for something that's supposed to be up there for a long time. Yeah. It doesn't take a lot of wobble for it to start to kind of deviate and potentially, you know, kind of come back to Earth. But, uh, yeah. you know, hey, not a lot of space debris. It looks very light and airy. And, you know, overall, it is a success. Like they were able to do this. Um, yeah. And maybe, hey, satellite propulsion of the future. It's very, very cool. Could be. Could so be. there you go. <laughs> Story number three. And, uh, and you know, again, in the show notes, we'll have the images there. If you just want to check that out over at computeramerica.com. Story number four. We're going to go ahead and, um, as Ralph likes to do, uh, story number four is generally reserved for uh, medical news. Not saying that we don't do medical no news through stories one through three, but story number four, no different in this case. And I will say, though, this is different because... When it comes to medical news and 3D printers, we've done a lot of stories about different mediums, uh, not just plastic, but, you know, uh, yeah. organ tissue, skin tissue, um, blood samples and blood cells. 
Ralph, we've done a lot of 3D printing, but this might be the first time we've done bone and it sounds like such a natural fit that i don't know why we haven't heard it before but story number four yeah yeah story number four this comes from medicalexpress.com one of my favorite outlets for this field a uh, story from the university of waterloo in canada we'll find out headline building new bones with help from 3d printing and the article really sets the stage well about what the challenge has been in this field and how this could be mm -hmm. a very very significant advancement so some great images here from the article uh some other references in the show notes as well so here we go a research team from the university of waterloo in canada has developed a new material that shares many of the same traits as bone tissue that's the key we're not talking about printing out plastic and trying to put it in your body to replace a bone. No, no, no. We're talking about a material that shares many of the same traits as bone tissue. Huh. And then using this material in 3D printers provides a new and innovative treatment option for patients undergoing major skeletal repair and reconstructive surgery. This is, this is important stuff. Yeah. So this is great. Surgical reconstruction in these cases again, major repair, uh, currently involves metal implants and donated bone. Donated I had no idea. bone. Yeah, that one kind of caught me off guard. I didn't really realize the world of donating bone tissue, okay? Now, surgeons, surgeons in this current environment have to request a specific size and type from tissue banks to best match their patient's anatomy, but it's rarely a perfect fit. Huh. And a recipient's body may also reject the donated bone. So these are the problems. Now, to solve these problems, to address this issue, the University of Waterloo team created a new biopolymer nanocomposite material that can be 3D printed into customized bone graft engineered to meet a patient's unique needs. Wow. So here you have a material that's like bone itself, it can be 3D printed and it can be customized to a, to a patient's unique needs. What's not to like about that combination? <laughs> it, it, it's it's such, um, again, as I said, from, kind of from the outset, it makes so much sense when you think of all the 3D printing in the medical news that we've heard of. And I don't mm -hmm. know why bone just never really came to mind, but um, like yeah. the challenges make sense, but also the applications make so much sense. Yeah, it does. And the article highlights the fact that this advancement might eliminate the need for metal plates, hooray, reduce the risk of infection, good, and increase the chance that a patient's body will successfully accept the graft. That's because of this material they've come up with that's like bone tissue. Their lead researcher noted, quote, we've created a material that is strong, 3D printable and combat, uh, compatible, pardon me, with the potential to become new bone tissue. That's a key point. Compatible with the potential to become new bone tissue. With this technology, we can achieve the patient-specific geometry needed to reconstruct bone defects with greater success. The, ma the material combines nanoparticles that mimic the composition of bone minerals and help strengthen the material. And here's the closer. This is the thing that's so great. Ultimately, the team hopes bone cells will grow and replace the biopolymer nanocomposite material with new bone generated by the patient themselves. The body will then excrete the biopolymer nanocomposite. So, wow, so I'm just it, stunned. So it's not even like a <laughs> printing a completely, you know, foreign object and, you know, you can print right. with, uh, certain kinds of cells and minerals and whatnot, right. but like it, it's actually a scaffold that then helps you put bone where there is literally nothing in its place. And then this just gets completely yes. broken down. And as I said, excreted. So what's not to like, there's a lot to like about that. <laughs> That's very, very fun. And, and of course the images you can see, you know, kind of the artificial bone and, and the, uh, you know, uh, I think these cubes that you've included in the show notes is to show just how complex and, you know, kind of small scale they can really make these, uh, these printings. They're very, uh, yeah. yeah. 3D printing is a cool technology. I, I I don't think anyone's in question of is 3D printing here to stay. Um, I think it's just 
uh, now just finding all the applications for it. And this is a great one. Yeah. So great story great number four. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. if you've been following along, uh, we appreciate it. And of course, you may see uh, there's more. There's more, Ben. There's more. Don't worry. These are honorable mentions, as you can see there on the top. <laughs> and these are stories that are not less. They're not worse. It's just that Ralph, uh, you know, um, trust trust us if ralph had his way he'd be here eight hours a day just you know reading fun <laughs> men, you know reading fun stories uh we've capped him at four and yes. with these four uh there's still way more that we could talk about and so he hasn't started to include the honorable mentions so these are great yeah. stories good stories but um yeah they're just ones we don't have time for so at least give them the headlines ralph you got it and another motivation folks to come out to computeramerica.com get today's show notes so that if you want to learn more about the stuff we're just going to very quickly highlight you can get the links and learn more so here's the first honorable mention for this week scientists recover almost 99 percent of pure silver from dead solar cells you know these solar cells don't last forever but you can recover 99 percent of pure silver pretty cool comes from interestingengineering.com check that out uh next honorable mention this comes from the university of oxford Origami inspired folding electrodes could reduce surgery needed to treat brain conditions. Hmm. It's a lot to sink in. There's so much great information, wonderful image in this article as well. Check that out. That's a cool medical technology breakthrough. Printable. The next one comes from interesting engineering via MSN.com. Headline printable perovskite. Solar cells achieve 26% efficiency and a 20-year lifespan. And Ben, you and I have talked about perovskite as a material that a lot of solar research is uh, looking at yeah, as a, a, a great way for the future. Ju just the other day, we were, we were just even like, what is perovskite? And now we're seeing yeah. it, oh, uh, they are iterating upon perovskite itself. So this is great. Yeah, that's right. And if you think achieving 26% efficiency, you go, well, that doesn't sound very good. No, no, no. In the world of solar panels, that's a... That is beyond that's anything a, that we currently do. That's not bad at all. And 20-year yeah. lifespan is good, too. So that's uh, that story. And then our last story here of the honorable mentions, we have four honorable mentions, comes from techspot.com and also was covered by many other outlets as well. Scientists develop breakthrough method for extracting water from lunar soil. And at first I thought, What? <laughs> learn about this it's pretty darned interesting again comes from techspot.com so that's our honorable mentions for this week <laughs> absolutely great honorable mentions and really great stories all around ralph i want to thank you so much for coming on the show and joining us here it, it's you know as always a lot of fun and you know just seeing some of these stories and some of these um topics kind of come up again and again uh, i'm mainly thinking about the first one with you know kind of the gravity battery right. uh, ladies and gentlemen like things are good right now that i know things are bad but things are also very very good and we promise <laughs> yes. and uh ralph you did a great job of highlighting that and saying that hey our problems have solutions so everyone if you want to find out more computeramerica.com you'll find show notes for all of Ralph's shows and until next time thank you so much tune in again next friday everyone have a great week thank you so much Bye bye